Thank you so much, everyone who's uh, got me here uh, today. This is a good place for me, obviously, to be in New Zealand uh, on this day. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to you about something probably a little different uh, in terms of how you might uh, tackle inequalities. The great elephant in the room of New Zealand. Uh, I'm going to spend about half an hour setting the scene uh, as to why I think self-control, and I'll describe what that is, uh, might be something worth thinking about in this context. This is the outline of the talk, and as I've just said, I'm going to miss chunks of it. So I want to set the scene by talking about self-control. I want to give you a little introduction to the Dunedin study, if you have not heard about that, just to give you something to hang the, the data or the research on. Um, then I want to show you what childhood self-control predicts in terms of how life turns out. Uh, thereby making the point that this thing's pretty important. Uh, and then I want to uh, reinforce that point by talking about the costs um, that go beyond the individual, the costs to family, whānau and society more generally. And then I want to uh, dwell upon a couple of implications or take-home messages. So, what is this thing called self-control? Well, at least what do I mean when I talk about self-control? Uh, it's not rocket science and it's not arcane or mysterious. In simple terms, it's the ability to regulate uh, one's emotions, uh, strong feelings uh, and desires, and the behaviours that link often to those strong feelings, uh, so that you can stay focused on tasks, meet challenges, and if needs be, persist in the face of those challenges until you get to your goal. Uh, there's some definitions there or concrete anchor points to describe what I mean by it. I think they're kind of everyday ideas that as you think before you speak, you don't blurt stuff out. That can result in very embarrassing situations. Um, you try and resist temptations. Um, you give a considered response instead of an impulsive one. They're kind of repeating the same thing, right? You keep your strong emotions in check so you can focus on the task at hand. Makes sense intuitively, this thing self-control? Uh, if you read through different science literatures, you'll see this idea, what they call operationalized or brought to life in different ways. And it depends on which frame of reference you bring. So if you're a personality psychologist, you're likely to talk about this thing called self-control, at least what I call self-control, as conscientiousness or impulsivity. If you're a child psychologist, delay of gratification. The delay of gratification was made most famous by the the, uh, the studies uh, out of America. Remember the marshmallow test? Uh, when those uh, lovely children were put in the room and told by a nasty old examiner, don't touch that, it'll be back in 10 minutes. And if you, if you can stay away from it for 10, you can have two. Uh, and I can um, confess right now that I would have been in there straight away. Uh, so economics, now econo economists are funny people. How many economists in the room? I don't want to see a single hand, please. Well, you know, econo eco economics is pretty much common sense, right? And yet they have to think up all these really weird terms to describe what they're on about here. Intertemporal choice. Um, that is, making a decision now that um, means you'll have a certain pathway compared to what you would do later um, if you made the same choice. Reward discounting. Okay. Well, I'm, no, there's no economists here, so I'll stop bagging them because they can't defend themselves. Neuroscientists, people that get into the grey matter, they are interested in executive function. That's the front part of your, your brain. That's meant to be the executive control centre. That's like the, um, the engine room that, that basically inhibits impulsive behaviour and guides you in uh, your pursuit of goals. Psychiatry will d dwell upon the clinical end, that's the extreme end where it causes problems for people, and that's called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And this is the real rogue in the pack, if you ask me. This is called management science. That's um, common sense masquerading as a science. Now, people talk about willpower or self-discipline. There's a lot, whole lot of popular psychology books right now on about this thing called self-control. You don't have to go far in the self-help section in any old bookshop to see something on willpower or character or strengths or whatever. Um, not so much strengths, I shouldn't say that. So that's to give you a sense that this thing called self-control is talked about differently by different people, all right? So if someone's talking to you about something that sounds like self-control, it possibly is. They just may use different terms. 
So why did we decide to study self-control? A series of findings that came out of the uh, Head Start program in, <coughs> that was run in the US from the 60s uh, that were intriguing, and you were starting to see findings in the 70s and 80s where the Head Start program, which took disadvantaged children and tried to, to do things with them to improve their IQ, was seen to be a spectacular failure in terms of improving IQ. However, these kids tended to do very well in non-predicted areas. They weren't dropping out of school. They weren't having uh, children at a young age. They weren't behaving in an antisocial manner. And people started to think, well, what is it about that early life experience that has resulted in these unpredicted outcomes? And a uh, Nobel laureate, an economist actually, uh, Jim Heckman, uh, came along and started to suggest that what was happening in the Head Start program was that the children were acquiring skills to self-regulate. He called them non-cognitive skills. Right, so not the numeracy, literacy stuff. Non-cognitive, which is actually a misnomer because everything's mediated through thinking at some point or another. But he was referring to this um, set of skills that allow you to adapt to challenge in your social environment effectively. At the core of these set of skills was this thing called self-control, at least in his mind. Now he came along, and I don't know if this is typical of all Nobel laureates, but he came along to us and said, you've got a great study, can you give me your data? Uh, this is something we'd been building up over you know, 30 or 40 years, working hard on, and, and we actually said, actually, Jim, it's fine, we can probably manage this ourselves. Um, so at his um, uh, spurring, we went forward and tested some hypotheses about whether measures of self-control obtained during childhood mattered down the track. That is, could it predict how healthy you were, how well off you were, whether you'd hit the terps and used drugs too much, whether you were involved in criminal activity, uh, how you were doing as a parent, well or not so well, and so on and so on. Um, why is self-control so very important today? Now you're going to start to hear about this sort of stuff more and more, I think. At places like The Listener, or, you know, but more mainstream um, press will start to say this self-control business does look important because all these things you know. We're living in an age where actually it may be more important, I wouldn't, I'm not convinced by this, but it may be more important than ever before in human history. Because we've got so much high calorific food at arm's length. Uh, we have a lifestyle that's conducive to sitting on the couch rather than being physically active. Uh, it's easy to opt out of all sorts of institutions because we've got free choice like never before. Uh, there's more substances available to more people 24-7 um, than ever before. Uh, we're marketed at constantly by um, Madison Avenue and their derivatives to buy, buy, buy. We're not real, not existing, not happy unless we're buying something. And of course, if you come from the delayed gratification um, uh, perspective, people aren't uh, geared towards saving for a rainy day. They'll spend now. So these are just, this is not some sort of science list, this is just sort of homespun, thinking about the practical implications of this self-control business for living successfully in the 21st century. The Dunedin study, very quickly, uh, 1,037 babies were born in uh, Dunedin in one calendar year, it wasn't a calendar year, actually it was April 1st, 1972 to March 30, 1973, one 12-month period. There were 1,139 actually born in that period who were still resident. When I say babies, I'm talking about their parents, really. Uh, still resident in the, in the greater Dunedin metropolitan area three years later. And that's when we started the longitudinal study. So that's the foundation cohort, 1,037. The 91% uh, of the 1,139 agreed to sign up. The 9% who didn't, by the way, didn't look any different from the 91% who said yes. Uh, they look the same in terms of perinatal um, health characteristics and social demographic factors. So we think we got a really good snapshot of that generation. Now, originally it was meant to be a five-year study. And we really messed up, haven't we? Look at this, still going. Um, we just don't know when to stop. Uh, so the, the idea behind it originally was uh, have those new birth technologies that came out of the 60s 
the increased sophistication of those birth technologies, which are keeping more babies alive, have they resulted in a group in the population who don't fare as well as those kids who aren't born in adversity? In other words, those babies that would have perished in the past, are they doing as well as their counterparts? Uh, and the first two follow-ups at three and five were pretty straightforward and focused on developmental milestones, reading, writing, walking, behaviour and the like. Comprehension, language, expression and coding and so forth. Pretty much what you'd expect at that particular age. Uh, and what we found, or what I should, it's the royal we, because I wasn't around then, um, what they found was that uh, not only um, was there enormous variability in this thousand general population, 1,037 babies, in terms of how well people were doing on these outcomes, they also had much higher levels of health problems than people had hitherto recognised. So for example, the rates of glue air in the mid-70s uh, weren't really recognised to be as high as they were. And, and so the founder of the study, Phil Silver, parlayed that into another six years' worth of funding, and we've gone from there strength to strength. So you can see um, on the right-hand side that we've managed to keep virtually everyone involved uh, over 40-plus years. Now, that's not the skite or show off. That's very important scientifically. And this won't surprise you, I don't think, to know that the major threat to the validity or value of these types of studies is what they call non-random loss to follow-up. That is, the people that drift away first and are hardest to find and get back in are not a random group. Oh, if they only were. It'd be really easy, life. You just start with a big number and let it whittle away over time. But of course, they're not a random group. These people who are hard to find and get back in um, are individuals um, within whom multiple difficulties tend to aggregate. So these are the people that don't have a fixed address, they don't have a cell phone, they might be in and out of institutions, they might be on the run from the law, and so forth. Uh, and these people are the ones you really want to keep in if you want to know the true picture of human health and development. Because these people have different exposures in life and they have a different range of outcomes than the easiest to keep and recruit 60%. Just think about this. Most of the world's knowledge is based on the easiest to, to keep in, healthiest, if you will, 50 or 60%. That rate of follow-up and retention basically cohort integrity is unparalleled in the world for a study of this type. Um, often people will uh, comment on that uh, and I think uh, we often get credit as the researchers. Um, it's the study members themselves that deserve the credit for that commitment. So, this is a map of where people are. I always put this one up, particularly after I show that um, retention slide the one where it says 95%, because you can believe this. Uh, I tell you what, overseas people don't believe it. And I've, over time, I've managed to at least come up with my own narrative as to what they're thinking. And it was sparked, I started really thinking about this seriously, it was sparked one day by giving a talk in an American university, and I heard this, <coughs> which was literally someone's jaw going off their hand and hitting the, um, the lectern. Um, and so I imagine they, they think something like, well, this Dunedin study um, is at the bottom of New Zealand, that's where Dunedin is, and New Zealand, of course, is at the bottom of the world, and nothing ever happens down there, clearly. And these, these poor people have to sit around in between these assessments waiting to be re-enrolled, because it's clearly the high point of their life. Um, and that's how they do it. And of course, I always throw this up to say, actually, no, because we all know this, Kiwis move around a lot. Uh, don't worry about the details, just know that 25% of our cohort live overseas now, so 250, or just under. About 10% in the Northern Hemisphere. You can imagine the logistic challenges of trying to find people, bring them back, get them here in one piece, get them home in one piece, uh, and then when they're here and with us in Dunedin, they go through a really gruelling uh, eight and a half hour day assessment where everything you can imagine is asked about and they're subjected to all sorts of interesting, weird, wonderful tests. I'll show you some in a second. You know, the method is everything. Anyway, measuring childhood self-control. We wanted to come up with a measure that captured the level of self-control that people had during childhood. One age is not good enough. One source of information is not good enough. All right? 
Every particular approach has error. You want to triangulate with multiple sources, multiple methods over multiple times. You're starting to get your handle on something real then. And that's exactly how we did it. So we had measures from uh, psychometrists, which give tests, uh, pediatricians at age three. We had t uh, observations from parents at age three. We had observations from uh, staff. We had observations from teachers. And we had some self-report by age 11. So we took measures of self-control, assessed differently, different sources, and combined them into a single measure. And what we got was no surprise. You all know about the bell curve? Great. OK, so it's just like height or anything else. We saw a distribution that went from low, most people in the middle, and some people, a smaller number, had very high levels. And the types of questions we asked and had responses on were, again, pretty intuitive and common sense type questions. Does your child act impulsively or out without thinking? Uh, can they wait uh, their turn? Do they have a low frustration tolerance? Are they easily distracted? And so on. Now, the outcomes. And this is made possible because, remember, we bring everyone back, so we're able to get really good measures of outcomes. The outcomes um, we looked at. First, we wanted to know whether being, having differences in childhood self-control, being at a certain point in that distribution, did that predict your likelihood of ending up with bad physical health. And again, our rule of um, doing it multiple ways applies here. So we just didn't measure blood pressure. We just didn't measure uh, overweight. or We just didn't measure fitness. We measured a whole lot of things and combined them. So very briefly, what we picked up on here was um, fitness. And we do a, um, a submaximal bike test. We measure their body. And that, that thing there is um, kind of a cool thing. You stand on that and it tells you how much of your body is fat um, and how much is muscle. I haven't gone near that for about 10 years. <laughs> yeah. We'll do some more um, uh, tricky tests. This is something measure, measuring what they call endothelial function. The endothelium is like seven tennis courts if you laid it out. It's the part of the, the body that lines the, the, the vessels in your body. And that's an important part of your physiology because that helps you uh, the vessels, whether they arteries or veins, expand and constrict, and that's an important physiological function. So we're measuring the health of that there. Um, we just do normal blood pressure stuff, of course. Um, oh, here's some lung function. So there's a, this thing they call the body plumismograph, which is basically like a, um, a telephone box with clear plastic that you sit in, and, you, and it's, and it's um, pressure controlled. You close the door, and you huff and puff into this mouthpiece. And you do all these interesting, what they call um, uh, respiratory maneuvers. And all the wires go off into a fancy machine and it prints out all this amazing stuff about your lungs and what sort of shape they're in. Which you can't do, of course, if you're going to someone's home or via the post. We have dental exams. So the dent this is a professor of public health dentistry. He comes a lot. Uh, so we have direct examinations, for example, of gum disease. Uh, and we take blood at the end of the day, and that enables a number of biomarker studies that is indicators of various aspects of health taken out of the blood. So that's um, a combination measure we used, first of all. And we have a cluster of um, metabolic abnormalities, that is whether you had three or more of obesity, blood pressure, high cholesterol, total cholesterol, low HDL cholesterol, uh, low fitness, uh, and high gly glycated hemoglobin. That's a measure of glycemic control or blood, uh, sugar in the blood. Uh, and 17% of our sample, by the time they were in the early 30s, had three or more of those risk factors. When I say three or more, they had them above the clinical cutoffs that doctors use to prescribe medicine. Right? Uh, about 20% had gum disease. Um, we threw in some STIs. So we had, via blood, um, uh, it was um, herpes serology. We used inflammation markers and respiratory airflow obstruction. So we combined all that. What do we find? Now this is a, this pattern up there, just look at that pattern. Now the thing you need to do when you look at that is look at the bottom part and it says low to high. Now we divided the sample, the whole sample, into quintiles, that is 20% blocks. So the lowest is the lowest 20%. 
The number two is the second 20%, that's 20 to 40. 40 to 60 is three, 60 to 80 is four, in the highest level of self-control across all those ages in childhood, averaged. And what you see, uh, and this is the first time it's been done in a study as comprehensive and broad as ours where we've controlled for socioeconomic status and childhood IQ, which are related to the outcomes we're looking at, so we had to adjust for those, make sure they weren't the explanation. What you see on the left-hand side is adult health outcomes. Z-score is just a fancy stats term for saying it's a standardised score. Just know that zero is the average. Being above zero uh, in terms of health problems is not good. Right? This is the number of health, bad health stuff you've got. Right? Being really well below zero is much better. And what you see is a gradient or a graded relationship. The lowest level of self-control in the first decade of life, you had far worse health than the next 20 percentile, and they compared to the next, and so forth, in a graded association. In other words, I think up until this point, people assumed that there were some children who were in the difficult to manage box, they were the bottom 10, 15, 20, 25 percent of the population, and everyone else was pretty okay. Wrong. Okay? Now this is an incredibly comprehensive, directly assessed measure of health, every which way you want to look at health. So, ten, first 10 years predicting how you are physically, in a broad sense, in the fourth decade of life. Oh, we pushed the, 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 the boat out a bit, we took some um, pictures of people's eyeballs, and we can measure the micro vessels in the eyeballs, and that tells you about the macro vessels in your body, all right, and in your brain. That's what a picture looks like. That's my eyeball, I think. <laughs> um, so, wider venular ca um, caliber, just without getting to the technical aspects, is associated with ill health, likelihood of stroke, dropping dead of a heart attack, and so on. What you see there is a similar pattern. There's a bit of a kink. This just goes to show it's real data, right? I haven't made it up. Uh, there's a bit of a kink, it's not perfect, but what you tend to get if you take the bird's eye view is the same gradient relationship. That is, the lower the self uh, childhood self-control, the worse your outcomes if you take a picture of your retina and use that as an indicator of your overall cardiovascular health. And again, you get the graded association. Uh, we also had interviews about substance abuse. The types we're talking about are tobacco dependence, alcohol dependence, cannabis, harder drugs. And we also asked our study members for permission to ask people that knew them well to fill in some questionnaires about them and their substance abuse. The picture we got was the same. Those people with the lowest level of childhood self-control had the highest level of substance dependence. The red line is uh, the direct diagnosis based on interviews with people and the blue line is what our informants said about our study members. Again, this, this gradient is key. This gradient talks to inequality, and I'll come around and emphasize why at the end. All right, so what you see is the same pattern. Low self-control, much higher rates of substance dependence problems. The lowest tends to be always at the uh, highest level of self-control, but there's intermediate steps. What about wealth? Uh, what about your straightforward income or um, socioeconomic status? Same pattern. All right, so the lowest childhood self-control, you're in the worst shape in terms of income, and also you have the lowest socioeconomic status. And there's a graded association again. What about behavior around wealth creation and planning for the future? Uh, saving, uh, for example. Um, or home ownership, do you have some uh, um, uh, assets by the time you're in the, your early 30s? And this won't surprise you. That's the line again. So this single variable is looking sort of ubiquitous, isn't it? It's everywhere. Wherever we look, we find this graded association. It's pretty lawful. And these aren't trivial differences, by the way. This is not trickery by me to make it look stretched out so it looks impressive. These are meaningful differences in terms of people's lives in these particular domains. 
Self, others. Again, we don't always rely upon our study member because they might try and paint themselves in a better light than, than they actually are. So you go outside the person. Um, and same pattern. Credit problems and financial struggles. Those with the lowest levels of self-control have the highest uh, financial struggles and informant rated financial problems. What about doing bad stuff? And we're talking about the sort of bad stuff, not that you all, all of us do, that minor stuff, uh, it doesn't really count. We're talking about really bad stuff that you end up in the clink for if you get nabbed and have a lousy lawyer. <laughs> right. Um, so this stuff comes, these are official court conviction records from the Australasian jurisdiction. There you go. Bit of a flattening, but it's still there, the gradient. These are people uh, with adult criminal convictions of all types, violence, non-property, um, and, and so on. So those with the lowest level of control had the highest rates of convictions, and then you have a drop down right to the bottom with the highest level of self-control. What about parenting? This is about just single parent um, child rearing. Um, I haven't got the other slide, I don't think. Um, but the same pattern ap applies to if you measure um, warm, sensitive, stimulating parenting, the same pattern applies. Those with the lowest level of self-control have the least warm, sensitive, stimulating parenting style, uh, and those at the um, high end of the spectrum have the best in that regard. That was obtained, by the way, that information was obtained by going to the homes of the study members when their firstborn was three, year old, three, three years old and actually videotaping uh, those interactions. They went through a series of structured tasks, the child and the parent, um, and they went from easy to more stressful or challenging. <coughs> this is just about having a child um, uh, in a, uh, as a single parent, which is uh, associated with a number of difficulties. It's just harder to get by when you're by yourself. Uh, and you see the same pattern. Oh, there we are. I made an assumption it wasn't there. So there's your videotaped observations. So those with low self-control were the least warm, sensitive, stimulating parents. It's almost a straight line. OK, now all these patterns I've shown you have adjusted for the influence of socioeconomic difference or status as well as IQ. IQ is not, not a very nice thing to be talking about often, um, but it does make a difference and does predict not only educational outcomes, but it predicts longevity and morbidity. Uh, exactly why is not known yet. But it's an important thing to adjust for. Um, it applied to boys and girls. If we took away just the people with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, about 7% of the sample, it was still there. We tried to make this go away. We hit it with everything we had. We thought how we would destroy this association, and we could not, despite having a lot of data that we could test to try and make it go away. This looks pretty damn robust. We ruled out um, the effect uh, or the idea that it was entirely because childhood set up high-risk behaviours in adolescence, and that, that's what was driving the adult relationships. That's what I'll leave out, but it's there, the proof of that. Um, we also ruled out uh, that there were subtle differences across families that were driving this association. And we paired up with a sister study in the UK that's of twins uh, and showed that. I'll whip through all this uh, and talk about some costs. Well, this will be of interest. Uh, this is from the British study. The uh, parents and the teachers the teachers only, actually, for this, were asked when these children were 12 about their level of disruptiveness in the classroom. They had their level of uh, self-control measured at age five, so seven years prior. Same approach as the Needham study. And what you see there is uh, that in the classroom, the level of self-control, albeit approaching uh, adolescence, uh, determines how disruptive you are in the classroom. Of course, that's disruptive for other children's learning, I guess. It's the important take-home there. Um, cost to government. This is the social benefit data from MSD, which they kindly allowed us to merge. Uh, and what you see, this is long-term benefit use, not just occasionally, which is the, the net social net that we all approve of and like. Um, and you see a similar pattern 
those with the lowest levels of control during childhood had the longest, these are months, 50 months on benefits between ages 21 and 32. 50 months, what's that? It's four and a, that's a long time. And you've got much lower levels here, less than, or about 10 months. So real differences in the, in the real world. Um, now people quite rightly, and this is, I'm about to get into the, what do we take away from this before um, we go to some discussions. People have rightly said, oh, that's all very well, but actually you're just making a, a case for people being boring. All right? So it's uptight, self-control, can't do anything wrong, got to do all the right stuff, stay focused on success, all that stuff. Um, but think about it. What have I just shown you? I've shown you stuff that most people would like to have. That is, you'd like to be in good health. You'd like to have a few um, bucks in the bank. Uh, you'd like to be successful in your job. Um, you'd like to uh, be a good parent, right? So it shouldn't surprise that. It's not the boring hypothesis at all. It's the opposite. Those with low self-control were the least satisfied with their lives, and again, you have a gradient. Those with the highest were the most satisfied with how their lives were going at age 32. Okay, implications. That's kind of a, a no-brainer, right, based on what I've just said, if you believe the data. I hope you do. Self-control. Um, if you were able to modify self-control in childhood in a propitious way, that is, you enhanced it, at whatever level you had, this would be a potentially a good thing because it would have impact upon the rate of crime, how healthy you were, whether you used various benefits, whether you were looking in good shape as you entered the middle years financially, and it, of course, improves the chances of the next generation. Now, the gradient tells you something very important. I have a lot of self-control at work. Right, that's how I manage to do what I do. But I have to be honest with you, and I don't know how best to display this other than to stand over here and say, when I go past, I work hard all day, so like today will be a long day, work hard, get, past, get home, and I cruise past the fridge at 10 p.m. Now, can you see that? <laughs> right. So, I need some more self-control. We can all do with some self-control. So it's not just about kids, it goes through life, it's like a muscle. You exercise it, you keep it strong, it'll um, hold you in good stead. But all levels, when you're a child, could uh, result in improvement if you bumped it up. No one's immune from this. Now, when you start talking about a whole population, this is about the inequality bit. When you move the whole population in a direction, you start to get some society-wide benefits. The types of interventions and I'm not a person that researches those, but I know about what they are. The types of interventions you can bring to bear on enhancing self-control skills, because this ain't some sort of mysterious stuff. This is just a set of skills you can learn. The in interventions work best for those with the least levels. All right? That's really good news. So the kids that benefit are the most are the ones that need the most. Self-control skills, another good thing, can be built into everyday interaction with a child, be they at um, ECE or be they in primary school. I mean, you know that old chestnut the snap game with cards? That's a way of learning self-control. Right? You can integrate this anywhere, anytime. You don't have to be heavy-handed or boring and dry about it. But what they also find, the people that do the intervention work, is that the kids that benefit the most and for whom self-control generalises out of school and other parts of their life are the kids that do a lot of repeated practice. All right? So it's something that if you want to integrate into your workplace, you need to make sure it's not just there for 30 minutes a day. It's got to be everywhere. And it's got to be generalised to the home. So parents need to get on board with this. And if you manage to address this uh, tray or behaviour early in life, you can equalise at a fundamental level life chances because this self-control predicts school readiness. School readiness predicts academic achievement. Academic achievement predicts job type and you can see the cycle thereafter. Not just job type. I've shown you all these other things you'd like to see more equity in, right? Health, for example. So this thing called self-control uh, looks like it could be very interesting and worth 
um, exploring and maybe even applying uh, in multiple settings. The only universal intervention that society condones is school. So everyone's hopes are in your hands. Thank you. <laughs>